In the next of our deep 90s episodes here in the Levity Zone, we roll the clock forward to January of 1998, when yours truly appeared on National Public Radio's Tech Nation program with host Dr. Moira Gunn. Since our last show here in the Zone, set back in 1995 and 96, my chosen medium of Internet Virtual Worlds had exploded as hundreds of thousands of users clothed in digital representations called avatars, had homesteaded their way into second lives in these worlds. Bear in mind that these worlds appeared well before internet voice chat and video, social networks, and networked gaming. It was a wonderful time for me as my organization, the Contact Consortium, had already held its first and second conferences in San Francisco, and my book, Avatars had just been published, hence the following interview, a stop on my book tour. Bruce Damer has written the new book, Avatars, Exploring and Building Virtual Worlds on the Internet. I asked him, what are avatars, and how long have they been around? Avatar is a very, very old Hindu word that means God's embodiment on the earth. It also means change, but that term was coined by Chip Morningstar in 1985 for the very first avatar world called Habitat, which had these crude you know, avatars in a two-dimensional world walking around on Commodore 64s, representing people out online. And this was back before the internet really came. And, uh, so in the that, 80s. In the 80s, and in the sort of mid to late 80s, the Lucasfilm funded that particular very first virtual world. And now there's all forms of avatars, from floating 3D gigantic talking heads with your own voice to dancing body avatars, the little postage stamp avatars, you know, what you look like in cyberspace. So it's anything out in cyberspace, or maybe any one out in cyberspace that embodies a sort of a human being and, uh, of some shape or form. Yeah, yeah, an avatar really has to be em embodied. That's the key term. Disembodied avatars are sometimes called cadavatars. Ooh. Sort of avatars that have, somebody's software has died, but they're still hanging in this collective cyberspace. And there's bots that are automated pieces of software that are running around trying to convince you they're real avatars or they're, they're doing tasks in the world. But there's no real person no. under the controls at that point. That's a program. That's a program, an agent. Now, where do, you, where do we find avatars out in cyberspace? I mean, do you have to have some uh, secret thing, or can just about anybody find them? Well, just about anybody uh, can be an avatar. Well, you have to have, of course, a personal computer and a modem to connect you into the Internet and a computer that's relatively late model. Uh, but there are all kinds of different virtual worlds. The three-dimensional worlds need a little, little more punch in the computer and little two-dimensional worlds like the palace that runs on pretty simple computers. There's been about a half a million people using avatar worlds in the last two years. So really, it's, it's a cross-section. It's definitely, you don't need the goggles and the virtual reality helmets. Uh, most of the users are in their bedrooms at home connecting in with people in these collected worlds. We're all familiar with, I think at this point on the internet, with uh, chat rooms where you're typing text to each other and you see it go by, um, and with virtual communities, uh, sort of people with common interests. Where do avatars fit in that world? It's very interesting. MUDs, which are a very old form of text, chat, virtual communities, have been very successful starting in about 1980. Uh, people create these worlds of the imagination just by their words. So you might type, I'm going into this room, and then the, the MUD tells you back, there's so-and-so in the room, and there are three exits, and there's so many objects lying on the floor. So everything's done through words. For years and years, there's always been this dream of, of how do we ever make that visual? You know, the World Wide Web and Mosaic and Netscape and those sorts of things put a visual face on the documents in cyberspace. The Internet was essentially originally a community building mechanism. So how to put a human face on cyberspace? How to make it visual, make it more accessible? And so all this has been percolating up over the last few years. And then gradually in 1994, 95, various companies with various experiments managed to make it work. And... 
my organization, the Contact Consortium, was founded before all these worlds appeared. And we thought, oh, it'll be years. You know, everybody will need great big fat pipes for this. And the companies that have been able to make it work have done miracles. You could walk around in enormous 3D cityscapes, a la Hollywood's vision of cyberspace or Tron, you know, the great original sort of avatar movie from 1980. You can actually do that over, you know, just basic modems. So there's a whole ecosystem of approaches to making avatars. There's no one standard, but it's all bubbled up from this whole concept of cyberspace as being a place for people to gather. Well, you know, it, it is interesting. You know, when we were talking about, you know, sort of taking off from chat rooms, we, we can go off from, uh, you know, just text back and forth to each other to sort of this embodiment, 3D embodiment. Of, but you walk into the chat room and you say, hi, here I am. Um, that it is out there. You are able to do that today. Now, give us an example of where you might go. Well, it's, it's really interesting, a, a story that there was a virtual world that was born in 95, the spring of 96, and there was a family, or is a family in, in Virginia, it lives out in rural Virginia, and the family had a five-year-old son, mother and father, and a little new baby that was born, and they got into the internet, they, they had bought a brand new computer, they were in some text chat rooms, and they learned how to surf the web and everything, but they got somehow connected into the beta program for this world that's 3D with sound with your own voice called On Live Traveler. And the way Traveler works is you speak into the microphone, your voice streams in, and all those people who are floating around you who are close enough get your voice because it's all summed up. Not only that, phonemes are yanked out of the digitization of your voice and it drives your avatars and facial gestures. So the mouth's moving and the eyes are blinking. So when you see groups of avatars talking, it really feels like there's a real conversation going there. And as you get closer, you hear it louder. So as a family that was brand new, new into computers, new into the internet, they got into this. And eventually, Edith, whose name in the world is Sunset Dawn, she became a major hostess of events in these worlds because she said, well, when I first came in this world, all it was was men talking about their computers. You know, and I've got to do something. I've got to liven it up a bit. And she created football. She told the company that had created this world, that we're in the South, and there's not a week that goes by without football. And we got another problem in that teenagers will come into the world in these floating heads and, and bang you around, bash you around. They'll push you into doors that carry you into other worlds. So she combined those two things and created football, and they created a, an avatar head that was the, the ball, and they built a, you know, a whole football ground. And so the people, especially these teenagers, could push the ball back and forth. And, and she was a sort of social architect in this world for about six or seven or eight months. Then her baby, little Marquis, and this is written in the book, they, they actually agreed to write their whole story. The baby Marquis had been watching this from his crib because the PC was sort of near his crib. The whole family was sort of clustered around the PC every night, talking, hosting events, talking to relatives, and they were leaving him out. Even the five-year-old son, Matthew, he was, you know, doing his thing, and he, the baby could see these heads and hear voices coming out of the PC. And so one day, when he was about eight or nine months old, when nobody was around, and the PC was obviously on, there were heads talking, they could sort of see the shapes. He got up where the PC was somehow, got the right keyboard key, pushed down to open the mic, he picked up the mic, put in his mouth, and started sucking as hard as he could <laughs> to get attention. And nobody was there for the first while, but you could sort of picture this baby looking at the screen and sucking, looking at the screen and sucking to, to make contact. And what was happening in the world was people seeing Sunset's beautiful white tigress avatar making these terrible sucking sounds, and it wasn't sort of H. Ross Perot. It was just this unexplained <laughs> thing, and these, these floating heads would come over and say, you know, Sunset, what, what's happening? Is a tornado tearing your house up? And so... Little baby Marquis realized that he had done it. He'd made contact on his own and, you know, uninvited by anyone else. And he started, you know, shouting, screaming. And then this terrible sound was emerging into cyberspace. And the screaming but it looked baby. like the avatar was his mother. Yeah, but... But it was all his sounds and... His sounds. It was, it, he was driving the gesture. So when he screamed, the avatar was screaming. And uh, Eve came in and said, well, What are you doing, Marquis? Oh, you're using the internet. You know? <laughs> And from that point on, you know, he's talking about having to maybe put a pacifier over the microphone to, to keep him from destroying it. But now he's two, 
and you can see him you can come up to him in this virtual world and anything you say to him he says what so you <laughs> say hey marky what how you how you doing he says, what but answering your question of where this is going i i asked a couple of the family members so what do you think these worlds are good for and you know what why do you spend so much time in them and they said well it's like it's a friends and family space if we can build a room where Marquis's first words are hanging in the air, like a, a kind of a design of a kitchen or something, and where you have this refrigerator door where you put all the pictures of Marquis and what he's drawn, what he's broken, and then he's in there and relatives can come in and talk to him, it's a meeting place for the family. And the other son could have a homework world and the best friend world and the treehouse world. And so what that baby essentially showed us in the future of cyberspace is something pretty powerful, that cyberspace provides an intermediary space for your mind, your creative things, your meetings, your friendships that isn't, you know, video phones showing my office to your office. It's a meeting spot, and those meeting spots can be crafted individually for people, and they could have hundreds of them. And so it's a new medium of human contact. You're listening to Tech Nation, Americans and Technology. I'm Moira Gunn, and my guest today is Bruce Damer. His new book is Avatar, Exploring and Building Virtual Worlds on the Internet. I find that a fascinating story about this family, but what it really shows is that we now have more than text going back and forth. We now have the embodiment of sound, and for people who say, well, gee, I don't have a microphone, it's like, I think you'd be surprised. I, I just bought a new laptop, and mm -hmm. they have this sort of communication center on it, and I clicked on it, and before you know it, I was actually talking to someone uh, over my laptop, and people are saying, why are you talking to your laptop? It's like, because I guess I can. It was a, it was yeah. a whole phone, it just came with it, you know, and uh, just a run-of-the-mill laptop. So I think that uh, the capabilities there are far more than, than people suspect. But again, we have sort of human interaction. For instance, um, you were talking about the teenagers. And one of the things you talk about in your book is as people come up to each other, there's a certain etiquette. And then there's things like avatax and av abuse. Yeah. Now, what does that mean? You, you started to allude to it earlier. Cyberspace is not an artificial place. It's a model of the real world. And this is why in the Avatar's virtual world community, we don't talk about virtual reality. There's nothing virtual about the reality of the interactions you're having with people. It's as real as if you're on the telephone. And they're real people and they're real interactions. And so you, you get a large community like the Alpha World, Active World's community. That has 250,000 registered users. And it has 400 cityscapes that are all connected through these funny teleport stations. And in the book, there's this satellite image of one of the cities, the original city called Alpha World. And down there, not only can you see millions of objects and people built parks and coliseums and strange, bizarre floating cities and highway systems, but there's a lot of social interaction. You know, we held a, a garden party at a farm that was built by a, a lady whose world name is Laurel. And she lives in Louisiana. She pops her laptop open and does landscape architecture for people. She designed a herb farm. We held a big garden party there in the summer, and, and we had to evict somebody. Someone walked in in the avatar of a black woman and started making all these horribly derogatory references to women. And we had the, the so-called Alpha World Police Department help patrol there. They didn't have any special power. They couldn't sort of bum steer them out the, of the party. They only had the power of persuasion. So they sort of formed a little group of officers, you know, and they were using big beefy avatars and tried to talk them out of it. You know, this is a, a garden party, and please, you're offending people. And uh, for the first time, we had to excommunicate or, or pull somebody out of the world because at our party was the person running the server for that world, walking around in mufti. His name was Protagonist, which is the name of someone in Snow Crash, which is a famous novel by Neil Stevenson, the sort of the Bible of this medium. We said, okay. And so Protagonist came over and said, if you don't stop, I'm going to have to do something. And I really can. And the person didn't believe it. And then suddenly, for that person, their server or their, their software didn't crash. Something sort of worse happened. Everybody in the world disappeared except for them. And then for an hour afterwards, protagonists watched as this person wandered through this neutron bombed cyberspace from their perspective with no social interaction. And that was probably more devastating than having a little message bump you out of the chat room. The cyber shunning. Or <laughs> it was, yeah, it was like a banishment. 
The essential thing is in these virtual communities, some of them have av abuses as verbal abuse, and av attacking is when your body's being attacked or someone's jumping in between you and someone else you're looking at. But it tends to be more often than not, the community will come around the abusing person and use social mechanisms to get them to stop or at least leave our area, please. And it's pretty effective. Again, there is no real physical thing to stop you. One avatar, I would imagine, could walk right through another avatar. Is the software set up so that there are those apparent physical boundaries, even though we all know it's out in cyberspace? There's a primatologist in our organization who categorizes gestures in bonobo monkeys, orangutans, and humans. And she takes a look at one of these avatar worlds and says, this gesture's all wrong for a primate. The distance is wrong. So she's sort of counseling avatar designers a little bit. But it's only now that we're starting to understand this whole body presence happening in virtual worlds is, is no different. It's still a primate function. Our brains are still functioning that way. So people do develop gestures, offensive gestures or jumping funny gestures, ballerina pirouettes and things like that. But it's a vast field because it's sort of recreating human society interaction in this quote-unquote artificial medium. If you haven't created your own avatar for whatever reason, um, and you're sitting there on, say, America Online, lots of people are, and you're not very technically proficient, can you get into one of these avatar worlds and be provided one? Each world has what's called a dummy tar or default avatar. And sometimes they're called dummy tars because they look like storefront mannequins. There's no character, them, no face and everything. And then people clothe their avatars. They might walk into a store and as they earn money in some of the worlds, this is a token economy, they're earning cash, they're gambling, you know, they're playing bingo with other avatars and then they could go and buy body sprays. Worlds Ooh. away is you know, they could spray their bodies and then accessorize their avatar. And then you So they don't have to write their own software to do this. It's provided within the world. Yeah, usually usually some of them are nerdy worlds you know you have to build 3d models outside and import them and some of them are human interface worlds you just simply clothe your avatar i get email all the time from little kids that say i am these 14 personalities in these six worlds and they can't stand human looking avatars they say we want wild avatars i want an avatar that's a cloud so the younger the kid, the more unbridled the imagination you find. And some of the more bizarre avatars are you know, under 10-year-olds. When I was a kid, we had Etch-A-Sketch and Lego and whatnot to sort of take what was in our imagination. And now these kids have got these worlds. So they're going beyond the normal, boring adult street and town metaphors and building abstract worlds and avatars. My guest today is Bruce Damer. He's co-founder of the Contact Consortium, a global forum dedicated to virtual worlds on the Internet. I'm Moira Gunn, and you're listening to Tech Nation, Americans and Technology. Well, tell us about the uh, Contact Consortium. You've been saying we a number of times. We. I'm assuming this is who you're talking about. It isn't the royal we. It's, it's a, a very interesting group. Back in 1993, 94, I had been doing some work and a lot of talking with a group of anthropologists called Contact Cultures of the Imagination. And it's a group that meets every year. They've had 15 conferences, annual conferences, that talk about really way out things in anthropology. One of them being what happens when we contact an extraterrestrial civilization. You know, pretty way out for anthropologists. But it was a safe place where anthropologists could meet science fiction writers and space scientists and speculate you know, have a safe place to really speculate. And they would do exercises where they would set up an, a, an alien world of the imagination, and then they would make contact with anthropologists that had no prior knowledge of what this team had set up. And they would test the limits of human bias. You know, when you have anthropologists screaming, kill the alien, you know, you, you, know, you, you push the, the, the human bias, but anthropologists aren't supposed to, to do that. So they had started doing things in MUDs online, doing contact communities for credit courses at lots of universities, and they were winning awards. They were doing this fantastic job of simulating societies and allowing students to, to make contact through this text-based world. And we thought, well, it's going to go visual one day, and it's going to be a huge explosion. And what it's going to be fundamentally is not about people contacting aliens, but about us contacting each other in a new means, through digital space, not through outer space. And it was going to be an enormously exciting and frustrating and eye-opening exercise when this happened. And so we founded the organization in 
early 95 and thought, well, we'll wait for several years. And then suddenly, you know, a month later, after we founded the organization, all these worlds started appearing on the internet. So from that point, we just worked as hard as we could to build it up to bring a plurality of humanity into it, from anthropologists to graphic designers and musicians and writers and, and people interested in the politics of virtual worlds, to bring them all together as soon as possible, to mix them together physically at conferences, which we hold in workshops, and we do lectures all over the world, and, and we do projects in virtual worlds like architecture competitions and team student projects. The goal for the organization is at the beginning of this medium, if we can enrich it, and you enrich something by introducing two people who wouldn't have otherwise met, then you, you empower it later. So down into the 21st century, the people that we make contact with to enrich this medium will, will have a big impact on how it emerges. If someone was interested in, in finding out about the contact consortium, how would they do that? We're a virtual organization of the true ascent, so you could either get in touch with us through our website at www.ccon, that's charlie, charlie, or nancy, dot org, O-R-G, or meet us in some of the worlds that we built where we have our offices and our labs and our meeting rooms in virtual worlds and we're always in there walking around. And the rent is the right price. The rent is, is reasonable. <laughs> it's reasonable. A little bit less than this building. Well... Is there an economic model for this? Has there been any commercial orientation so far? Well, there's a lot of speculation. For instance, some of the worlds where people are going in and, and building economic portfolios and sort of token economies, they're, they're paying hourly through CompuServe to be in that world. And that world generated quite a bit of income for CompuServe because it really satisfied a need beyond just chat rooms because there's so much more to do. Um, as far as other economic models, education, we're running a project now with 42 teams, student teams, building uh, virtual structures in a common cyberspace. And we have six professors of either architecture or sort of virtual education going to be judging this in February. So I can fly into that world and, and see these students, you know, like Amish barn raising, building these structures. And, and they're two architectural design briefs. And the winner of the competition will win a world, the whole thing, the whole shebang. And so what that's teaching students isn't necessarily classroom serial education. That's teaching them how to cooperate on a complex project over national boundaries and budget their time. It's teaching them the skills they'll need to have living and working in the world, actually. So there's one justification. And another big, exciting commercial uh, dream for these worlds is uh, Hollywood uh, studios are looking at them saying, wait a minute. You mean all of the million Trekkie fans that, that spend hundreds of millions of dollars, or billions in this case, on, on Trek, to go to conventions, to go to movies, to buy costumes, to role play constantly? It's their world. I mean, that's their culture. What would happen if we could build a world that was a Starship Enterprise world? That there could be a thousand Starship Enterprises where these Trekkie fans would form a team, go in, do training, rehearsals, and then go live in their own world on the net where every episode's different, where another Trekkie fan has written a program. And it's basically a giant simulator, and they're throwing scenarios at this crew. And that thousand crews are going at the same time in different scenarios of different episodes you know, that are brand new all every time. And that the best crew from, say, 1999 they go on a mission with William Shatner. So the avatar sitting over there on the captain's chair is William Shatner, and he's sitting in Malibu or wherever he lives, and he's acting in an episode that's live. It's really him. Or Leonard Nimoy, he's in another one. So those crews would be working toward this, this goal, and it would be essentially a third box office for movie TV properties. You know, before we get too far away from education, you've just returned from South Africa, and that's a, that's a fascinating application that uh, you're looking at there. Yeah, in fact, I was somewhat humbled, as I think everyone ought to be visiting South Africa, because it's a country that's so complex. You know, it defies a normal sort of quote-unquote Western methods and explanations, but I visited pretty much the whole country, up and down, including uh, the big township of Soweto, which is six and a half million people near Johannesburg, it's twice the size of Johannesburg. And, you know, Nelson Mandela is passing the torch on to the new, new generation, but the education is the top priority. Now, this is a country where 60% of the schools don't have flush toilets. 
and teachers don't have chairs, so teachers are standing up in these terrible, you know, uncomfortable positions giving lessons without having people to sit down. So there is a balance here. But what they're doing in Soweto and across the country is building internet centers where kids can come in to do projects where they can connect with the world from these centers where there's enough staff and there's actual phone lines that work and things like that. One of the goals that I had going to South Africa was to connect with the people there to create a project in Soweto probably initially where these kids would come in to this room where up on the walls is beamed these virtual worlds and they're sort of inside them by the fact that they're beamed on the walls and they'll build Soweto world. They'll design their own avatars and make great African, you know, Zulu kind of performance avatars. They'll design their world. They'll put their sounds in. They'll go out with cameras and take pictures of Soweto and place them on the walls, sort of a gallery of their history and build this world, really get motivated. And then one magic day, they will be inviting guests into that world. And it might include kids from disadvantaged areas in the U.S., like kids from schools in Oakland, are coming in. And in their school, they've got it all beamed up and they're in the school auditorium and they're coming in they're going to meet these kids from Soweto. And those kids are going to say, this is our lives. And if the kids in Oakland say, that's cool, the kids in Soweto are going to say, you think this is cool? No, this is just our lives. Well, that might change the way they look at their lives. They brought this to the world and the world came in. We've done many of these in the last two years between schools. And the center in Madeira would be one of the, the so-called cyber bridging points where we can allow the building of worlds and the sharing of those worlds between parts of the earth. Well, Bruce, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. My guest today has been Bruce Damer. His new book is Avatars, Exploring and Building Virtual Worlds on the Internet. It's published by Peach Pit Press. For Tech Nation, I'm Moira Gunn. This broadcast was brought to you in part by the Tech Museum of Innovation in San Jose, California. The tech is dedicated to the spirit of innovation in Silicon Valley and throughout the world. Associate producer for Tech Nation, Americans and Technology, is Monte Carlos. Recording engineers are Howard Gelman, Ed Herman, and Seal Muller.